Mark's matched it last week with that um, word about hospitality. Um, and I really liked how he, how he talked about it. The word is hospital, you know, and I really feel like that's what our church is called to be, as is, is a, is a hospital. So we, we facilitate uh, healing through hospitality. Uh, and so I love that, and that was such a good word. Um, so I just want to um, kick off today with, with this scripture from Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, 26 to 28. And it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, I want to take that hardened heart that you have and I want to give you a soft heart that's filled with love and compassion and that can only be given to you by the Spirit, because this is what it says, I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That's a hard word to say. Statutes. And you will be my judge, or, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. In order to be his people, we need to be people that are full of his spirit. And so I'm just going to pray and ask just the Holy Spirit to do a work in us. We just, oh, we just sang a song all about it. I will make room for you to do whatever. Hey, who's scared about that? Who, who sings that song and thinks, ooh, hmm, that's a challenge. Lord, right now, would you just come and make room and do whatever you want to, only by your spirit and wherever you want to lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, I just prayed the dangerous prayer for you. So, um, so the title of my message today is Who's Leading the Way? See, the way is a spiritual journey that is outworked in our daily life. The Old Testament pathway to God was by works. It was observing the requirements of the law, and it meant that you had to work hard and religiously follow it to attain internal cleansing. Ezekiel 36 is a prophetic chapter that proclaims the coming of a new covenant. The way, um, sorry, the way of this new deal is defined by Jesus' journey to death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension to heaven. That means as followers of Jesus, our spiritual life must go through the same journey that Jesus did. This is administered by the Holy Spirit. And baptism is actually a physical representation of that. That when we go down, we're actually saying, I identify as a sinner. I identify as someone that is broken and falling and I need a savior and so I am going to actually die to my old nature, also known as the flesh or my sinful nature. So I'm actually going to die to that. And as I come up, I'm believing by the power of the Holy Spirit that I would be raised to new life, that resurrected from the dead. And how many know that we also have the great hope that Jesus is coming back and then our bodies will be redeemed, which is the complete process of salvation. Did anyone get that? It was all, I tried to summarize the New Testament very quickly, the gospel. <laughs> it's symbolized through baptism. This is good news. In fact, this is great news. It is great news. Jesus paid it all. Jesus came, he lived on this earth, but he, he was just, he's just one man. But look what he can do through his spirit. He can give us a new life. And so I just have a couple things that I feel to speak on that sort of part two of my message a couple weeks ago, I talked about living the narrow path or being on the narrow path that Jesus said, you know, the path is very narrow. The, the path to destruction is very wide and very broad, but the pathway to life is very narrow. And I feel like today, this is part two, would be just some keys to just stay on that path. And it has everything to do with the Holy Spirit, which I love the Holy Spirit. 
So it's important that we, number one, recognize the Spirit at all times. He's a helper. Just ponder on that for a second. He's a helper. In Greek, it's parakletos, which is advocate or counsel. Helper. He's on a journey with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So he's given us his spirit as a helper. And what does he help us with? He helps us navigate life through God's lens. Sometimes we try and navigate life the way we want to do it and the way we feel like doing it, but actually he wants to help us navigate life the way he did, which is complete reliance and trust on the Father, complete reliance and trust on the Holy Spirit. He gives us that. But how many know when he communicates, it's not exactly very loud or sometimes even very clear who's with me on, on that. He, he often will just give you a bit of a nudge or he will, you just get this overwhelming sense of something or, or maybe someone comes along and they speak something that has the Holy Spirit attached to their words and then you go, oh, that just unlocks something for me. It's not often audible. Sometimes it is. And there's probably many of you in the room have heard him audibly. I haven't heard him audibly, but I've heard him clearly to the point that it was like, wow, that could have been audible. But I've got to be honest, it actually takes a lot of trust to hear, to follow. It takes a lot of uh, intimate time with him and, and getting to know. And I think he designed it that way because we're not robots. He, he wants us to know him intimately, so it means his communication with you is specifically tailored for you for how you hear and how you listen. But it's all to do with helping you. He wants to help you, and that's because he's our guide. He's the one who leads us on this journey, this pathway to Jesus. And so he uses communication in lots of different ways to help us. I love that he often will just do little, sort of like subtle nudges and promptings. But Amy and I, when we moved to Napier three years ago, it wasn't a thus saith the Lord, loud, audible voice, I want you to move to Napier and pastor Gage Church. It was his peace. Just this overwhelming sense that we needed to move here. And every other location we looked at just didn't feel right. Any other city just sort of was like, nah, it just, that's not it. And every time we looked at Napier or prayed about Napier or visited Napier to see family, just, it felt right. That's the Holy Spirit. And then when it came to actually this church, it, it wasn't, again, it was that same process. We just felt this overwhelming sense of, yeah, that's it. That's home. That's peace. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the helper guiding. You're with me today. So recognize him. Recognize the Spirit. He is with you. He is guiding you. Allow him to help you. That's probably the one thing I would say right now. Allow him. Let him help you. You don't have to manage this on your own. You don't have to go through life alone. Rely and trust on the Holy Spirit. The second one I want to say is receive the Spirit. He's our teacher. Now, often we'll pray for someone to receive or be baptized in the Holy Spirit. 100%. I'm all about that. But actually, I'm more leaning into receive the teaching of the Holy Spirit. That one has more to do with his conviction than it is necessarily about the power. We want the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. So in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Spirit for power. But what comes with his power is his correction and his nudging and his little his little bits of like, oh, that's probably not such a good idea. Receive him today. In John 14, 25 to 26, these things I have spoken to you while remaining with you. This is Jesus speaking. But the helper, so I've just talked about that. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said. So there's two things he does. One, he teaches us all things. Second thing, he reminds us of Jesus' commandments, Jesus' ways, how to walk out this discipleship life, this journey, the way of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is our number one teacher. I'm all about finding other teachers. I'm all about going online. But I got to be honest, the number one teacher is the Holy Spirit. He is the king of YouTube. 
He's the king of the Bible app. He's the king of all the th- platforms that you can get amazing teaching from. And like I said, those things are supplement. But the number one is the Holy Spirit. And when you dive into his word, who's the one that reveals the word to you? It's the Holy Spirit. Who's the one that shows you like, I've read that before, but I've never read it like that before. It's the Holy Spirit. Who's the one who wrote the word? The Holy Spirit. It was inspired by him. Number one, receive the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Because why? He's the one who's going to teach you all things. All things pertaining to Christ. All things pertaining to the kingdom. He's your number one teacher. And he's really good at it too. Why? Well, who's the best teacher in the world? Jesus. But here's the difference. Jesus could only teach who was in front of him. For example, 5,000 people, incredible teacher. He was captivating. Oh, who would love to sit under Jesus' teaching right now? Get off the stage, Andrew. Jesus is here. You know, just, wow, Jesus. But who can actually teach with the same authority and the same power that Jesus had to everybody all at once? It's the Holy Spirit. I find that amazing. Trust in him, pursue him, and receive the Spirit's teaching today. He teaches us how to stay on the path, how to love God and others, how to submit to God and authority, how to walk humbly, how to serve, how to give. That's the Holy Spirit. And it's not just about teaching knowledge. It's actually about becoming like the teacher. There are people that can quote scripture. I've had people who have used scripture against me. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not like the teacher. Even Satan used scripture to try and trap Jesus. So knowledge isn't just the pinnacle. It's becoming like the one. It's becoming like the teacher. It's becoming the word itself, transforming you from the inside out. That's the Holy Spirit. That is who we do life with. And my third one is respond to the Spirit. He's our leader. He's our leader. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit. I'm going to pause there because that picture that we have up here is of Jesus and it's such a, a fitting picture because you see his footsteps and you see it's, it's implying that I'm walking in his footprints. As he steps, I'm walking on the very place where Jesus just walked. And that's what the Holy Spirit's guiding us. So it says here, walk by the Spirit. This journey is, is not as physical as you think it is. It's far more spiritual. So it takes walking by the Spirit to walk the path that God set before you. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That goes back to Ezekiel. God give us a heart, a soft heart. See, the desire of the flesh is actually a hardened heart. For the desires of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. See, our flesh actually is going to completely trash the law or it's going to uplift the law to the place of God. It's actually going to put so many rules back into place. It's going to, because trusting the Spirit is actually harder. It's easier to trust the law. It's actually easier to obey the law because it's black and white. Whereas the Spirit actually demands something of us. It demands our attention. It demands our loyalty. He demands our, how do I say it, our obedience. It's easier to be actually under the law than the Spirit. Personally, that's my view. But where is life? See, the law was cursed. If the law wasn't cursed, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. 
But Jesus took on the curse of the law. He fulfilled the requirement of the law. So now under the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, we have freedom because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom is hard work. Who's experienced that in their life? It isn't easy, but it's worth it. And that's where life is, and that's where freedom is, and that's because that's where the Spirit is. So the Spirit brings conviction, which leads us away from sin and death. Don't get that confused between guilt. Conviction leads us away from sin and death. Counsel, he's a counselor, leads us to Jesus in right living. And the third thing is, is he then calls us. He leads us into fulfilling uh, the plans and purposes because he has a plan and purpose and we fit into that plan and purpose. For many are called, but few are chosen, which basically means you, if you are giving your life to Jesus, you've been chosen. There's a purpose to your life. There is a purpose to what you do. There is a purpose to every single thing that God has for you. And so he's called you and chosen you. I love how at the end of Galatians 5, towards the end, after probably the, a favorite passage is that we love the fruits of the Spirit. Hey, I love the fruits of the Spirit. Who likes the last one, though? Self-control? Who like the all long-suffering patience? We love the love, joy, peace, patience. Anyway, this is my favorite thing to talk about. Straight after that, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow Him as well. One of the greatest examples in the Bible, and I, I, I'm going to wrap it up with a story. Julie, you want to come up and jump on the keys, and then we'll, we'll get into baptizing some people today, which is super exciting. Um, as you can see, I'm quite, I'm quite animated today. But um, this story in, uh, is about Philip the evangelist. Um, there was also Philip the disciple. Scholars believe they were two different people. Philip the evangelist was a deacon. He was part of actually distributing the, the food and, and um, that community work that the early church did. Uh, but I'm just going to read this, and because I want you to read how Philip was led by the Holy Spirit and the result of that. So Acts chapter 8, 36 to 30, 26 to 39, it's a bit of reading. But as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Kandaki, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And he was now returning, seated in his carriage, and he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go and walk alongside the carriage. I love this. Philip ran. That, that's revelation right there. Why? Because it's automatic response. Yes, Father, I will do what you ask me to do. And he ran to the carriage. It's so good. And he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, how can, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb, he is silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Why can't I be baptized? I love it. He ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. I love this. This is so good. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Incredible story. What could happen if you're led by the Holy Spirit? It takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes getting out of fear. It takes getting over insecurities. It takes there's a lot of humanity in the way. But God wants to use your humanity, my humanity, and display his power through you to reach someone else. So I believe that the journey of the Holy Spirit isn't just about feeling good and feeling loved, which I'm all about, but finding freedom. 
it's also about displaying his glory here on earth through broken vessels, through people who are just ordinary, not perfect, but love him and actually want to follow him. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't. People try. People put the Holy Spirit in a box. People put the Holy Spirit on trying to find him. And I just can't do that. So when I, when we prayed, make room. Do whatever you want to. And I'm the pool available. You, if you're sitting there and thinking, well, why can't I be baptized? The Holy Spirit's leading you. I would do what he says. Now, it is sacred. It's something that we take very seriously. So if you just want to go for a swim, then that, that's, not, that's not the point of it. But if the Holy Spirit is saying, I have something new for you, I have something fresh for you, I have healing for you, it's a brand new start, a new beginning. You've got to die to the old self, but a new self is going to get resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then I would be saying, why can't I? So, I actually came prepared this morning. I actually have towels over here. Uh, I also have a clipboard where you can write your name down and we can follow you up. I also have some little t-shirts like this. If you weren't dressed to be baptized... So all the excuses are gone.